in that cloud of jargon, and we miss the point of it. Now, gift bait is fabulous. It's the right thing to do. Getting it right for every child, well, bloody hell, why wouldn't we? I think we should be doing that anyway. So don't get, don't get yourselves put off with the language that's in it. That's, sometimes that's the language we need to use to convince other people to spend their money on it. But it's not actually the language that, that makes sense to the rest of us, right? So that will be what we're going to do. So, <coughs> right. <coughs> Probably will. Right. This is, um, <coughs> sorry, I was, I'm just annoyed. I'm just annoyed if it goes, but it drives them nuts when you walk up there. Um, Herman Melville, it's not a test. He wrote Moby Dick, but a bit of wheel. Um, and what he's saying there about we cannot live only for ourselves, yeah? There's a connection. There's a reason why human beings have the brain the size they have. And we've all got a big brain. Although it was confirmed this morning that men's are bigger than women's. Did you know that? It's actually a scientific fact. <laughs> the reason our brains are the size they are, it's not so that we can tweak, it's not so that we can drive cars, it's not so, it's so that we can establish relationships with fellow human beings. We are highly sociable animals. That's what we do. We're, we have a conscience. Therefore, we have empathy. Therefore, we connect, which is very, very rare. The conscience part, in fact, is unique. So that's the reason we have that. So has anybody been watching the Sochi Olympics? Right. Tell me when, when Jenny Jones won that bronze medal, the first in snow, because we don't talk about Alan Baxter because he's not the Um <laughs> Tell me, when, when that smiling face was there with her mum and dad, tell me how wonderful she felt. Did you smile? Did you think it was good? It made you feel good, didn't it? See, when Catherine Granger won the gold medal and was standing on the, on the rostrum at, the, at the, what, the, the Olympics two years ago and was, was crying, and you're, oh, it catches you. Now, that caught me. I don't know Catherine Granger. I don't row. I don't ski, I've never been on a ski board. I don't know Jenny Jones, but it caught me as well. <coughs> and you kind of help yourself doing that. That's that connection. That's that humanity that's there the whole time. We can't help ourselves. We can't work against it. But sometimes what we've done over the years is, <coughs> professionals have seen it as a weakness. No, 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 you need to be, you need to be professional about this. You want to become involved. That sort of stuff, that's wrong. Being human is not a weakness, it's a bloody strength. That's why we're the top of the food chain. That's how it works. That's absolutely fundamentally about what we're about. So, with that in mind, you're all here today because it's an in-service day, and I know how they work. Oh, he's a teacher. Jesus, <laughs> <laughs> loads of in-service days. <laughs> Too many, I reckon. <laughs> but I would never say that to her. <laughs> um, so, you're all here because of the job that you do. That's why you're here. But I don't want you to be here just because of that. I want you to bring your whole self into the room. The two things I know for certain, you're either a daughter or a son, okay? We're all that, at least. <coughs> We're at least that. So I want you in here as daughters and sons, as sisters, as aunts, as uncles, as brothers, as husbands, as wives, as partners, as mums, as grandmothers, I'm all kind of <laughs> as grandfathers, be in here as humans. Because the work you're doing every day, you couldn't do without those key human attributes of compassion and empathy and caring. And people who are not cared for don't care. So when you care, you make a huge difference to people every day. Huge difference. So it's really important you remember that. So your whole self in the room. So don't be sitting here thinking, well, how does this fit into the policy and the strategy and how does this fit to the standard operating procedure? Thing? Don't think about that. Because lots of that stuff is used by people not to do things. You know how we've got to that stage now when you said, you, you can't even hug children anymore. Tell me what it says you can't do that. Where does it say that? Does it say anywhere? So I was speaking at a conference yesterday at um, the Moira Anderson Foundation through in <laughs> 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 um, 
is the same thing. What he's saying there is, though they derive nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. But there's part of a Buddhist philosophy says that to make yourself feel good, you should do somebody a favour every day and don't tell them you've done it. It makes you feel really good. So, it's that notion about humanity. We're human. That's the first thing. Okay? That's the, that's the main thing. If you take nothing away from this today, it's that. You're humans first, and then you become something else. You're not a professional first, and then you know, I became a chief executive, and then I became a human. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> it's the other way around. And the danger is we lose some of that stuff as we, as we progress. Let's not forget it. Right. If we think about violence, is, violence, I always say violence is my thing. I forget. Violence prevention is my thing. <laughs> and so, uh, if you think about violence like an iceberg, so the bit that we deal with is that bit that's above the waterline, the bit that we see. And we're really good at that. And I'm speaking about violence, I'm speaking about bullying through to suicide and everything in between. For every murder we have in Scotland, we have eight suicides. Suicide is self-directed violence. It's a way of dealing with a problem and a challenge using violence. And it's, it's a dreadful way to do it. And we're starting to do things about it, and it's getting a little bit better, but it's still part of Usually young men. Sometimes you want to but usually not. It's a great thing. So, bullying, through to suicide, not therapy. Okay? That's what it is. Now, we're really good at that bit above the waterline. The bit we see, we're really good at that. Detection rates in Strat 5 for investigating murders 98.7%. And we've got the detection rate that's the envy of. Uh, around the world, people used to come and see how we did it. How we did it is because we caught the fakers and the stupid, that's how we did it. Um, <laughs> And of course, we were very <laughs> So, we need to understand in that spectrum of things um, about not just the stuff that we know about. If you take domestic violence or violence against women, for instance, domestic violence, violence against women, a woman will be the, the victim of domestic violence about 34 times before she finds the courage to report. Does that mean that we're not interested in it until she reports it to us? We're not bothered until you tell the police. But don't tell us, we don't know, it's got nothing to do with us. That's absurd. That's absurd. So, the only way we're going to shift the size of the iceberg is not be working away at all. Because that just means the iceberg bobs up a little bit. Or melts, and it's obviously happening at the moment. <laughs> um, what we need to do is raise the temperature of the water. And that's big stuff. Yeah? For Scotland, one of the big things is, my name is Scotland, I have a problem. Alcohol. Huge issue for Scotland. 
Minimum unit price will make a difference to that, it will start. But it's a big, big issue for us. If you think about alcohol now compared to what it was 15 or 20 years ago. Now I don't know if there's anyone, I'm not going to, again I'm not going to look at anybody. But anyone of sort of my age, I remember at home my mum and dad used to have a wee bottle of Advocat perhaps. <laughs> Yeah, there's some in here, well done. Um, maybe a couple of bottles of baby shams <laughs> for the ladies. Um, maybe a wee half bottle in case something really important came out. You know, like a minister or something. But other than that, that was what we had. I've now got a wine cooler at home. I've got beer, I've got spirits all over the place, I've got most liqueur. I don't like spirits, only thing I drink wine. You get me, if you want to buy alcohol back when I was kicking around and getting into the store with my mother. I always asked us as well, I remember it, who remembers the co-op store number? Yeah, see, see that learning road that never goes wrong. We used to have to go to the public house, to the pub, into the wee off sales pit, and chap the bow hole and the door open, and the guy said, what do you want? And you go, for there. You get the supermarkets down and at least four rows of alcohol. You can get it, it's, it's in by colour, you can get the way that way. It's in by country, there's loads of stuff, it's beer, it's spirits, it's expensive, it's cheap, it's sight, it's got everything. And while we're taking our kids round in there, in the front of the trolley, because they gave us a wee trolley so that we could put the wings on. Because <laughs> we're walking around about, we're buying, there's bread, we'll need bread, your dad likes this, we'll get your dad that, your mum likes this, we'll get that, and then we'll go buy the wine. So we're starting to do a bit of work for Diageo, and we're starting to create the customers of the future. We're starting to say, here's the, here's the wine, here's the apple, here's what we do. And kids actually think it's normal. I've got, my daughters are 26 and 32, which I know you think hard to believe. The worrying thing for me is that, um, well, you know that, that wine and a, a younger palate likes sweet. Younger palates like sweet. And that changes as you get older. My daughters are now at the age they actually like the wine I like, which is a bit of a worry, I must admit. Because mine used to be safe, it was never taken, it was always the it was always the rosy stuff that disappeared. And now the good stuff's going, which is really annoying. Because we changed that, because it was just a commodity. And we made it sweeter. Well and I say we I the organizations that sell it. They made it sweeter. They made it more colourful. So that people would buy it. And we do buy the gallon and drink it. Four times as many men now die of alcohol-related illness than did in the 1980s, and three times as many women. There are people in the late teens now presenting at hospitals with sclerosis, which is something that 45 and 50 year olds used to do. <coughs> so there's a huge challenge around alcohol for us. One of the other big things about alcohol is how, it's, how, we've, how we've changed because we've allowed it just to be a commodity, is that when I was on the beat, a long time ago. We used to have drunks who were usually unconscious because it, that's what happens when you drunk too much. You get, you were about the tree going because it's a depressing and it just disinhibits you and you're gone. But now what we've got, we've got drinks that are loaded with saccharin and caffeine. And so we've got wide awake drunks. <laughs> <laughs> they're completely disinhibited. Completely disinhibited if they take risks. But they're bloody wide awake. <laughs> At least when I was there, they used to go to sleep. <laughs> now they're wide awake, and we don't know what to do with them. And it's not just the, it's not just the monks that made that drink, because that's the one that always gets brought up. And that's why that works so well, for what it's meant to do. It's a bloody tonic wine. So you shouldn't be surprised if somebody next two bottles of it, they're still running about like, it's a bloody good tonic. They're still running about. <laughs> So we need to pay attention to these sort of things, these little things that make a difference. Another huge, huge issue for us is equality. And if we don't sort out equality, we will never sort out violence. We just won't. If we don't fix violence against women, we'll never fix violence. Violence against women is an issue with men's behaviour, not women's behaviour. 99.8% of rapists are men. Why do we think it's about women's behaviour? It's not. It's about men's behaviour. And we need to do something about it. Though. Men need to do something. And we're trying to do that. We're trying to encourage men not, no longer to be bystanders, but to do things about it. To hear men speaking inappropriately, using everyday sexism, challenge it. Challenge it. I used to challenge it when they, when they told jokes about uh, uh, women 
I'd say, you can just get rid of my daughter when you're saying that. Or my wife. Or your daughter. Or your bloody mum. Would you be happy about that if somebody made that sort of comment about your mother? So men need to challenge that and say, that's not acceptable. Don't say that. That's not a nice thing to say. Um, a tweet. Um, and there was a, there was a great uh, tweet last year. Uh, a, a young woman tweeted it, and it was, I think it was in England, but she had, she had been walking down the street and there were some builders there. And uh, some of the, and they shouted at her, the usual stuff, get here, to that, and she's walking along the street. There was, she tweeted, there's a guy walking in the other direction, lifted his shirt up. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's a bystander, that's somebody saying, hey, that's crap, guys, don't do that. That's, that's, be my that's, that's, that's what we need to do, that's what men need to do. But I, I'm, not, I'm not picking out men in here because there is only about five or six here, so it would be unfair. But, but that's some of the things that we're going to do. So those are huge issues. We can't protect children, for instance, unless we protect our mums. Can't do that. You can, I always think, how do we fix child poverty if we don't fix family poverty? How do we do that? Just be the way in a gyro. Be the way in so much. We need to make sure it's an inclusive thing. So we need to be clear about that. There are some big things there that are important that, that every day we can't fix it and make it better. It just can't be made better like that. It just can't. I'm sorry, we can't be fixed it, but we can, we can make it a little bit better. You can start to change this by talking about it. You can start to change this by talking about it to your friends, to your family, to the people you work with, in the bus, and the train. Talk about it. Just say, that's really strange that we should be thinking about this and thinking about that. That's the things that will make a difference. No strategies and big policies. They'll help. But this needs to happen from the ground up because it's a human thing. It makes a difference. This was work that was done by a guy called Vincent Felitti. And it's about adverse childhood experiences. It was a couple of longitudinal studies he did on kids. Now, there's loads of these that I've just chosen his. There's the Dunedin study, there's Richard Tremblay, um, who's a, a, a Canadian. And one of the things that he said, Tremblay uh, works at Ottawa University, and he speaks about violent children, or aggressive children. And he was in Edinburgh about four years ago, and he was speaking at the university, and I was responding to what he was saying. Although the truth of the matter, I'd only understood about 5% of it. But anyway, he was, he was there. And we went for dinner after it. And I had said to him, you know, I'm still challenged by how as we learn to be violent. And he said, well, maybe you need to think of that the other way around. <coughs> we actually don't learn how to be violent. We learn how not to be violent. Because we are, by nature, we have that capacity for violence. Look around us. Look at the wars we've waged. We have that capacity. And the Brits, particularly the Scots, we're particularly good at it. So we learn not to be violent. And how we learn not to be violent is the clue to the early years. Because that's where we start to pick up on the human attributes. To communicate, to negotiate, to compromise, to problem solve, to learn empathy. And once we've got those things, violence moves down the tactical options menu. It's the last thing that we think about. But if you don't have those other things, the only thing you're left with is aggression and violence. So some young men, and a few young women, but violence is usually a man thing. Some young men don't make the conscious choice to be like that. It's not a choice. It's all that they know. They don't think, I'm going to be violent today. They just are. That's what they do. So it's really important now. So, if you think about um, when Malidi was talking about adverse childhood experiences, it starts, first of all, if, when a woman's pregnant, her responsibility is to create a safe environment for her baby. That's what she does. Now, if she's living in an aggressive, violent household with an aggressive partner, <laughs> she will create toxins, cortisol. It's a stress hormone because she'll be living in stress. That cortisol will damage the baby. It will damage mum as well, but it will damage the baby. Now, when babies then born into that environment, <coughs> one of the fabulous things, there's lots of fabulous things about humans, but one of them is we can adapt to the environment we're born into. That's how we can, humans live in the warmest places in the planet and the coldest places in the planet, the highest places, the lowest, we can adapt to our environment. So you bring a child into a war zone, you'll create a warrior. If he doesn't learn how to regulate what he's doing, if he doesn't learn other options to deal with problems other than violence, that's what he will use. Not because he chooses to do it, but rather because he can't choose anything else because he doesn't have a choice. That's what he does. So it's really important that and that pregnancy is really, and that's why for me the most important four years of a child's life are up to age three. 
that's when it's hugely important. I've been asking this of audience to lend because now and again I, I'll speak about emerging evidence. What I mean is I've just found out about it. Um, have you heard of the, uh, has anyone heard of the, um, the neighbours effect? Right, there, there's a guy called Colin Trevathan. Colin spelled with a W. The Colin is the Emeritus Professor of Child um, Biology at Edinburgh. He's a New Zealander. His work has been on early years. If you speak about attachment theory, if you speak about uh, uh, attunement, you're speaking about Colin Trevathan's work that he started <coughs> six years ago. That's what you're speaking about. You now think about it all the time. But Colin lives in Scotland. So, some of the work he's been doing recently, uh, some of the team uh, uh, was trying to find out how connected are babies? How connected are they before they're born? <coughs> and the neighbour's effect is this. This was in uh, New Zealand or Australia, did this, obviously. Um, what happens when, when women are pregnant, and you are much better than me, many of you, um, you will, there are time in the day when you put your feet up and just chill out. You know, you think like me. So you, cup of tea, feet up. You used to do it when the soaps were on, like neighbours, right? The neighbours effect. So, while you're chilling out with a wee cup of tea, you know the happy hormone, oxytocin? You know that one, the loved one, that spikes when, you're, when you have your baby? Giving you the capacity to love. That's the thing that makes you feel good when you get the oxygen. Would it was that easy? Um, so you're sitting there, that floods through the woman's body as she was in the womb. Just chill, relax. The world's good. Baby in the womb thinks, I'm like this. This is good. This is real. I like this. This is a happy place. I'm and what they've done now is, when baby's born, they've been running some experiments. And when they play the neighbor's tune, it calms the baby down. Because <laughs> the baby remembers, hang about, I remember that, trigger. The synapses connect up, so it's motorway to happiness. They're there. And it's cheaper than chocolate. It's, it's, you're there. So, babies are connected before they start, but we shouldn't think they are. When, when, when they're there, they're connected. <coughs> There's still an opportunity for them to develop because synapses are not connected. The, the, the brain's not quite blind, but it's not far away from it. That's when we start to pick up on the important stuff, and that's why those early years are so important. So, if you get a kid then who doesn't have those, doesn't pick that sort of stuff up, by the time they get to nursery, they'll be the kids who don't say much. And language acquisition is a powerful indicator of neglect. Powerful indicator. So they'll then come into the nursery. And they'll not play well with other kids. They'll not socialize. They'll not share toys. They'll get angry and aggressive if you try to get them to do something they don't want to do. It's difficult to deal with them. And so, sometimes these kids get themselves a wee bit detached. Not usually at nursing, but it starts. And then when they get to primary school, it doesn't get any better. And they start to get themselves further detached again. And that gets compounded by the fact that while they're detached, they're actually no learning to read and write and all the technical skills that teachers give them. So they fall further behind and they don't understand why. And then they go to secondary school and it's exactly the same. And normally, <coughs> the head teacher will say to the, to the, to the <coughs> at primary, to the head teacher at um, secondary, watch that dog, and he's a bloody mate, he's just like his brother. So before he even goes there, he starts to get that message passed on, here's somebody who's going to be a challenge. And it happens. <coughs> and then, of course, we issue them with hormones, and they don't help either. <laughs> and that's when kids start to get themselves completely detached. And then we start to exclude them. <coughs> and that's them. That's them. There are some kids who were excluded when they were 14 or 15, have never managed to get back into our gang again. They're out there. They can barely read or write. And the other thing they do is they start to get themselves involved in risky behavior. They, they can't even moderate that risk. And risk is something that we all take on. That, again, it's why we're talking a bloody food chain. Because we take risk. But we judge it well. We know when to take the risk and if it's worth the risk to do it. But sometimes these kids take the risk and don't understand it. So they try drugs, they try alcohol, um, teenage pregnancies, STDs, all of that stuff. And, and sometimes they'll get through it okay. Usually they get through that without previous convictions. They normally join the police. Um, <laughs> but sometimes they don't. 
Some claim they never recover from it. And they're the ones as well, when they get older, become alcoholics and drug addicts. They're the ones who die making sure that some areas of Scotland has a lower survival rate for men than there is in Baghdad because they get involved in that risky behavior. So it's really, really powerful. So Vincent Felipe, Adverse Childhood Experiences. But there's loads of longitudinal studies that will give you the same information. This was stuff that was done by Scottish Enterprise. And what they wanted to work out was, what kind of skills are young people in jobs missing? What, what, what are they lacking? And what they found was, this was 185,000 questionnaires. And this graph relates to um, those in low paid employment <coughs> and young people. And what they found was that the issues that were bothering them were planning and organizing, customer handling, problem solving, team working, oral communication. Those were where we had big challenges, o over 50% of some of them. Numeracy and literacy wasn't that big an issue. It wasn't. It's still an issue and it's still important. But those <laughs> ones at the top, those are described by psychologists, and if there are any here, non-cognitive skills. Those are the skills you acquire in the early years. Those are the skills you acquire when your mum or dad is reading to you. When your big sister is reading to you. When you're playing with somebody for an hour and a half on the floor. No, no way an iPad. But when you're playing with them. When you're outside playing. Falling out of trees. All good stuff. It's all good stuff. So, it's the same stuff. Now, James Heckman is a Nobel laureate. He's, a, he's from Chicago. Um, and... He's an economist. He was over here in 2004. And uh, he reckoned for every pound you spend in early years, you need to spend seven pounds in adolescence to get the same result. <laughs> so even if, if, if we don't manage to fix it in early years, if we don't manage to make sure young people and children get an enriched early years experience, then we can still get them these sort of skills and attributes later on that they need. But it's far more expensive and far more difficult. And usually it's because there's been a crisis. And the crisis usually means we're speaking to them in Pullman, or we're speaking to them in a hospital somewhere, because they're alcoholics, or they're drug addicts. So the drama's become a crisis. So James Heckman. He also said, and a couple of interesting things, he said, the most important, and I may have he said, the most important four, four letter work jobs for children. <coughs> and I thought, they love Jim. And he said, no, it's play. <laughs> so play is important, hugely important. But he said this, he said that a major determinant of successful schools is successful families because teachers can only teach what parents provide and it works better when they work together in a situation. So the idea that teachers should be doing this and you should be doing that, we need to be doing this together. Teachers are there to deliver technical skills and help out, but they're not there to do all the other stuff. It's a joint thing. And that's another thing that professionals do. That's why we're the violence reduction unit. Because if we put violent crime reduction unit, it would have just been about police. So we took crime out and we made it violent. So it's everybody's issue. We thought that was quite clever. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get any more money. <laughs> right. Um, Harry Burns, if you've never heard Harry Burns speaking, um, then you need YouTube. Him. Sir Harry Burns, CMO. And you'll get loads of his speeches there, loads of his presentations. Watch him. Whatever he's saying, right. And it's about early years. He's fabulous. You need to watch him if he's saying. But one of the things that, that he looked at <coughs> was worked by a guy called Aaron Antonovsky. And what Antonovsky did, he went along and he carried out a survey of people who had survived the, the death camps, the Holocaust, who were children who'd been born in the camps or who'd survived the camps as children. And he tracked them when they were older. And he went to see them. <laughs> and what he found was, as you would imagine, for lots of them, they did not have good lives. They, they, didn't, in, they didn't have good health, they didn't have good mental health, they didn't have a good social, they, were, they, they just had, they, they were damaged. And it was really difficult. But, he also found some people who were doing absolutely fine. And he chose to go and visit them. He always looks at Scots because we, we spend our time looking at stuff that doesn't work. As opposed to the stuff that does work. You know, we speak about bad kids, you know, that scheme there, drug addicts. There'd be a scheme with hundred kids and there'd be three drug addicts, ninety-seven who are not 
that we speak about the people who are. We do that all the time. We look at the things that make us ill and know the things that make us healthy. It's the Scots way. It's the Calvin gene. You know that idea that every silver lining does indeed have a black cloud? <laughs> do you know that one? We do that. <laughs> so, sense of coherence. So he called, he looked at the, the, these people and he found that they had three things that were common to them all. And he called it a sense of coherence. And the first thing they had is that the world was structured, predictable, and explicable. The second one, that they had the internal resources to meet the demands. And the third one was the demands were seen as challenges and worthy of taking on. Right? Now think of that first one. In your own life. You will feel stress when you've no control over what's happening to you. Stuck in a traffic jam and going somewhere. Plainly. Can't you find the way in? I mean, I've misplaced my lots of things. Particularly the older one. Like, you know, I, I used to think, your first kid's largely an experiment after you know, just, <laughs> She's living proof that it was. That it was. Uh, she's doing things. Detective Sergeant and the, and the major investigation. Um, so you, your world needs to be structured. That's why you'll get some men in Berlin who've spent lots of time in jail will tell you they prefer prison. The Daily Mail think that's because prison's so. I choose to think it's because society's so bad they'd rather be in there. And that's more worrying than jail being really too so. Because while they're in the jail, their life is explicable. They have got some control over it. They do recognise things that have demands on them, but they've got, they've got the capacity to deal with them, or they can get help to deal with them. Where they come out, they're back into violence, alcohol, drugs, chaos, the temperature of which is through the roof. So they're happier in there. So that sense of coherence is hugely important. So you imagine now if you're a baby, because babies are just we humans. You knew that, didn't you? <coughs> you imagine you're a baby. Your world needs to be structured, predictable, explicable. So sometimes you cry. And when you cry, somebody turns up and you smell it. Other times they cry and nobody turns up. Or somebody turns up and it hurts because they hit them. Sometimes they get fed and sometimes they don't. Sometimes their dad's drunk and sometimes they isn't. Sometimes their mum's drunk and sometimes she isn't. But one's not explicable. And if you're six months old, you don't have the capacity to deal with the demands as they come to you. So children are living with stress. Because they're little humans, they will live with stress just the same. So we need to pay attention to what happens, and that's one of the reasons hugely important in those early years that we do that. So, Antonovsky, it, he's written two books on it, um, and if you get a spare six months, you could maybe read one of them. Um, so I, I actually just choose to take Harry's pressy of the thing. It's much better, much easier. In fact, much easier to listen to you if you, if you, if you watch. So, violence, we're talking about that. Violence on me is it's like, it's, it's a public health issue. Violence is a public health issue. And if we think about violence like a disease, there are three elements to disease. Clustering, epidemic, wave, and transmission. Doesn't matter whether it's AIDS, cholera, TB, doesn't matter what it is, it's the same. So just think about violence like a disease for a minute. So, this is, um, I've got a point on this. On this horizontal axis, this is the Scottish index of multiple deprivation. That's the, that's the camera just completely. What the hell? Um, down this end, this is Mulgai and Bear Bay. <laughs> Maybe four bits of folk would be. Bits of folk, yeah. And on this end would be places like Shells and Shells and Man, the one we've spoken about for ages. That's good. Right, so that's it. Good end, bad end. This is this is normally where 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 police officers are born, but this is where they find their houses as soon as it's born. <laughs> <laughs> That's clustering. So, so the people who need our help are not hiding from us. They've been there for a long time. And we've known they've been there for a long time. And we have thrown millions and millions and millions and millions of pounds at it. So let's agree this. Money's just no the answer. I, I, I sometimes go to conferences and people say, oh, John, we just don't have the resources. And my response to that is, well, see, when we did, we didn't fix it then either. So let's agree it's not just about money. 
It needs to be the way we think about things, it needs to be our <coughs> attitudes, and it needs to be how we work. <coughs> know how much we spend. It's, because poverty is not just about money. In fact, the least of it is about money. That's the practical day to day stuff. The damaging, corrosive stuff about poverty is alienation. That's the stuff that makes a big difference. Think about Antonovsky. No part of it. So, that's the glossary. If we want to think now about transmission and epidemic waves, these two wee boys are fighting. Happens quite a lot. I, I blame women for this. And, and let me tell you why. I'm not going to ask them any put their hands up. It's not like they just lynched one as an example. Um, in Scotland, a wee boy runs at his mum when he's 10 or 11 and says a big boy beat him up. She'll probably give him a cousin. She'll do something else. She'll send him back out and he'll fight his own battle. Yes? Don't you dare let him just do that. You get out there and get that sort <laughs> So, sorry, girls, so are you. We need to change that. We need to realign because what it is to be a man, what's masculinity about? Yeah, a very quick story. My wife and I were coming into Glasgow one day. We were on the train from Lanark into Glasgow. Nobody else in the carriage, just hurry. Two guys get on. I don't know whether they're maybe Kate, you know, but two guys get on, sat up the other end. Guys in their late teens, early 20s, and they had a carry out, right? And it was in a green bottle. Um, and so, <laughs> what a brand. It's not a Coca-Cola brand. So, so what, what that means is, Within 15 minutes, they were drunk. Because the other thing that sugar and caffeine does is it gets into your bloodstream really bloody quickly. There's no messing about. Half a dozen swigs, you're gone. And the language gives quite choice. Right? Really bad. Not us and themselves. Not the typical Glasgow guys. You know, they're aggressive to each other. Uh, and if you're standing nearby, you think, they were doing that thing. Right? My wife's a teacher. We've been married 39 years. Um, she gives me a nudge. Don't speak to this. <laughs> <laughs> See? Now, the men in here will know. The last scene in that script is I'm going to gump one of them and throw them off the train. Now, it's head of violence reduction that that wasn't a good thing to happen. Or they're going to gump me and throw me off the train. <laughs> that's how we think about these things. We conform to expectation because that's what we expect is going to happen. My wife as a teacher has never experienced violence in her life. Ever. So... She thought, just go and speak to them. And she would have done. She would have seen, oh, Tony, I'll do more going after No, no, no. <laughs> no yeah. And they, did, they eventually calmed down because, you know, she gave them one of her spears. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked, which was reassuring for me because that thought it was just me that was cowed, but it's not. <laughs> it's so we conform to that expectation. So these wee boys probably didn't want to fight, but they did because everybody expected they should do that. And they thought that's what they should do. And if you're a young boy, um, there's, there's a guy who works with us called James Doherty. James has had a, a really difficult life. He's now mentoring for us. And James said, when he was at primary school, he used to be standing in a naughty square all the time. And he said, they expected me to be a particular way. He said, so I was. That's what I was. I was exactly what they wanted me to be. And what they told me I was. That's what happened. So we need to be careful of that. <laughs> And the epidemic wave will start because their big brothers will likely fight as well. Maybe even their mums and dads. And it'll go on and on and on and on and on for weeks, sometimes months, sometimes years, sometimes for life. Thrown. That's a Scots word. You know that stubborn to the power of pain? We do that stuff. We're really good at that. So it makes you ill and it's a real issue for us. Right, this is the story of David. This is a true story, and we chose David because we had a wee bit of CCTV footage, which I don't show anymore, but we had a wee bit of CCTV footage of David, and we used that, and then said, we'll tell you the David. So, it's a true story, he was chosen at random, who you think we made it up. Right. <coughs> David's mum is an alcoholic and lives in income support. He's born in March 1981. They live in Easter House, which is the 19th most deprived ward in Scotland. Before he's three, they moved to Milton, the 17th most deprived ward in Scotland because of domestic violence. He attends Gartanlock Nursery School. He attends Balanoc Primary School. They're rehoused again to Royce in the ninth most deprived ward in Scotland because of ongoing domestic violence. That's his dad. That's his dad. The family are moved to Easter House. They move in with his maternal grandmother because mum couldn't cope. 
There's his granny. She's the matriarch. It's a wholly worthless household. There are three adult uncles in the house with 120 previous convictions between them for robbery, violence, drugs, you name it, they did it. Rose was very good at dealing with services. Very good. Social work, you don't get in. The only people who got across the door were help. Help visitors were coming in. Midwives could get in. That's why when we're doing this named person stuff, it's really important that that is who should be doing it. Best placed, best equipped to do it. That's what I thought for help visitors. <laughs> this is where they live. It's um, six in a block, controlled entry, central heating, double glazing, running water, hot water. So in disease terms, it's a really good environment. There's no any issue there. Uh, <coughs> the family are rehoused again due to domestic violence. This is a new partner. This, just in the off chance, he thought there was only one violent guy in Glasgow. The rehoused again due to local authority plan for demolition and regeneration. Rehoused again due to local authority plan for demolition and regeneration. Rehoused again due to local authority plans for demolition and regeneration. David's 11. 11. <laughs> Great thing about humans is we can adapt to the environment we're in. David's adapted. David's surviving. But in order to survive, he's doing lots of things that you and I really don't like. That's what happens. But he's surviving. He's surviving. He starts at Leonard Secondary School. We spoke to his head teacher. He remembered him. He was diminutive, which is maybe an indication of his fetal life. He is involved in that rivalry. He's a true. He's out with parental control. This is where he um, This is where he was. This is the East End of Glasgow. This is Berlanup, running from where I am up there. That's the M8. Uh, Edinburgh's down here. Glasgow's down there. That's Berlanup. These are all gang territories. The dots are where we've had attempt murders or serious assaults or murders. Um, we had a we ran a gang strategy, I mean, a gang uh, program in East End of Glasgow about four years ago, um, and we reduced gang-related violence by 53 percent. Admissions to hospital for knives, knife injury down 34 percent. Um, violence admissions down 17 percent. Satisfaction in tenants in the houses up through the roof. Feeling safe went from 38 percent to 61 percent. We used to, we now get complaints about dog fouling. <laughs> so your, your KPIs are really important. <laughs> Have that in as a KPI. So, and this is, this is where they were. The gangs had been there for years and years. You know what we did? We said, God, you know, Dana, we've had enough, and we'll give you something else today. That's all we did. All we did. Stop doing it. We've had enough. Here's something else you might want to do. And it changed. In the detail was a bit. <laughs> No, getting poker in the table was a bit of a challenge, but, but that's basically what we did. We didn't make it more difficult than it needed to be. He moves to Easter House. This is the other side of the road from there. This is the Fort Shopping Centre. You'll know where that is. Um, I mean, I, I, I spent lots of my daughter's teen years at the Fort Shopping Centre. They've got a fabulous Zara there. <laughs> so I, I used to, there's a coffee shop no far away, we thought it was coffee shop. And I used to just sit there, cap the bags, get money and drink coffee and read my book. That was my Saturday afternoons. Um, I still do that now and again, except this time I don't give the money out and they buy the coffee. Um, so I take some satisfaction in that. So I drink loads of coffee and loads of camel shorts. Right. He commits a couple of pieces of pieces, refer to the reporter, the social work we come in for. The family moves to uh, Easter House. They say house bacon with intent, his cash room disrupted, he's excluded intermittently, then he's solvent abuse. The family are resistant to involvement. He gets done with assault, shoplift, and theft, breach of the peace, he's regularly drinking alcohol. He gets done with theft of cars, road traffic offences. The family move again. He's 15 and a half, he murders a man. He was involved in a fight, a gang fight. A running fight. A man get out of a taxi to go and meet his fiance. Steps out in the middle of the fight. Stabbed once in the upper torso and died at the same Absolutely horrible. David never left home that night and murdered somebody. He carried a knife. All his pals carried knives. I suspect his dad would have carried a knife. People he knew carried a knife. He stabbed people before and they haven't died. He's been stabbed before and he hasn't died. 
So when he actually said, I didn't mean it, he actually meant, I didn't mean it, because it was normal for him. He was conforming to expectations for him. It's no consolation to the man who's dead in his family. And our role is to make sure it doesn't happen again. So I'm not excusing David. I've locked up enough David's in my time. I don't have an issue with that. So I'm not making any excuses for David. But when he was at school, there isn't a career choice to be a murderer, or an alcoholic, or a drug addict, or a prostitute. There are no career options at any school that I know in school. None. But I did the UK a lot. I'm not sure about England at that school. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't it interesting that up this end here, we've got an alcoholic mum living with a violent partner, and she's pregnant, and she needs help. Then we've got a baby living with an alcoholic mum and a violent dad and needs help. Not much happened for David. We started to pay attention to David when he started to annoy us. Then we bloody paid attention, because that's what we do in Scotland. Punitive responses. And police are really good at that stuff. That's what we do. But we can have made a huge difference down that end. A huge difference we can have made. So, David. While well, he's in jail, his mum, and sorry, he's, uh, he's jailed for uh, murder. It's actually culpable homicide, if you follow it. While he's in, his mum dies of a heroin overdose, and his sister gets any secure accommodation. He participates in escorted leave, and while he's out, he gets done with supplying drugs. He gets released on a life license. His cousin Kevin lives at the same address. He stabbed a 14 year old boy in the neck because he looked at him the wrong way. So David's starting to infect others with his violence. He is arrested at a bloody Sunday commemoration march in Glasgow and he's still got the knife in his so and he still has traces of blood DNA on it from the wee boy he stabbed six weeks earlier. Feckless and stupid. And violent. David starts work with an OCG. That's an organised criminal group. He's a security guard. He attacks a man with a machete and he's dealing in heroin and cocaine. <laughs> His mum's sister Rose dies of a heroin overdose. He's a known knife carrier and he's involved in unreported assaults. October 2007, <coughs> he has a baby son. Start the game. Start the game. And you know we can make a difference to it. <coughs> now, don't think for a minute that you don't have David's here, and I know you'll know that. But I need to keep saying that to politicians. That you think this is just an issue for weekies. It's no. It's just not. Glasgow may have more Davids than anywhere else, but there's Davids everywhere. And what Glasgow has done in education, for instance, has reduced their exclusions by 85%. That's contributed to the fact that violence is down to 37 year old. It's not just the gang program, because they're back in school. We haven't alienated people and thrown them away. We've said, you're difficult. And even if you don't care about yourself, we bloody do. Because remember, people who are not cared for don't care. They will conform to expectation. And if they think your expectation of them is jail and they're wasters, then that's exactly what will happen. Exactly what will happen. Right, the first quote's by David Cook, who's a psychologist. Prediction's always difficult, particularly about the future. Um, I'm not sure who's the second quote. You're the 15th audience I've asked. I'm going to ask 15, and if nobody can tell me who, who that quote was, I'm claiming it. <laughs> <coughs> and it's that notion of it, we, you, can't, you can't prepare them for everything, but you can't make them ready for anything. And I'll tell you how I know that, because you're all in this room. And you've negotiated life. The same life that other people are there. The same streets, the same time, and you haven't bumped into anything. We need to give young people the attributes they need to make good decisions about themselves. Sometimes we need to be standing there holding their hand, we need to be standing behind them, we need to be leading the way, but most of the time, we won't be near them at all. They'll make those decisions themselves. And there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of great young people in Scotland who make good decisions every day of the week. And the key is, I think, those early years. They are people who cared about them as if they So, the ecological model of an individual relationship, community, society. For individuals, we, we need to think about these non-cognitive skills, although I don't like the skills word. The human attributes. We need to think of those. That's what they need to make good decisions for themselves. And if that's the case, then parenting becomes important. And I don't mean good or bad parenting. 
I mean, parents have been as good as they can be. So we don't need to get parents in there and get them a PowerPoint presentation on how to be a parent. We just need to support them and help them support each other. You know, that's what we need to do. Cultural norms, the uh, uh, community one, tolerance, don't accept it. We can make it, but we don't accept this stuff. We can actually make it better. So don't tolerate these things. We need to shut that. There's a notion of inequality, which is hugely important. And the Scottish, this one, that's the black cloud stuff. That's the word doom. We've tried this before, it'll never work. You know, oh, that drives me nuts. Um, so you need to aspire. Aspire to build cathedrals, we used to say. <laughs> And, it, and no garden sheds, and see if we're going to fail. Let's fail bloody spectacularly. <laughs> but at least let's try and make it better. Don't make it worse. <clears throat> so this is all the stuff that we have already. This is all the things that are there. Getting the right for every child. Valuing our young people. More choices, more chances. These are absolutely fine. We're on the right journey. But strategies and policies won't change a bloody thing. You will. People do it. People and attitudes are the things that are difficult. So, the strategies there is the frame. You need to work in that. And sometimes you need to translate the language. You know, from outcomes and all that. You need to translate all that language into saying, just do the right thing. Just do the right thing. You're dealing with a human. Need a cuddle, give them a cuddle. Fall down, pick them up. Need help, stand behind them, give them support. That's what Jatfek is. Curriculum for excellence, I think, as well as another one. I mean, it's not a curriculum for mediocrity, <coughs> which drives my wife nuts. She's a teacher, I said that, isn't she? She says, that's okay for you to say. <laughs> but it is, it's a challenge, and every change is a challenge. <coughs> but it's the right thing to do, because it's not just about reading and writing. Remember that one, the, st the, the skills that were lacking, wasn't it just numeracy and literacy? Wasn't it just knowing what the capital of France is? Wasn't it just knowing what, how, to, how to do calculus? It wasn't it about that. It was about the human stuff, problem solving, communication. Those were the issues. So that's how we need to spread that out as much as we can. And the partnership stuff is about heading in the right direction. And I think we are doing that. We don't always need to work together. We just need to understand where it connects and what your role is in it. So if we start with the outcome <coughs> and then work our way back. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to make Scotland the best place in the world to bring up kids. That seems like a pretty good... And technical jargon for that is a single order generating rule. That's what it is. <coughs> I'll tell you what, how that works. Have you ever seen thousands of starlings? A murmur, a murmur of starling. You see thousands of them all swooping. How do they never bump into each other? You ever thought of that? Well, obviously it happens. See, I've got more time in my hands. It's an angry stare and stuff. The reason they don't do that is they've got one single order generating rule. Fly as close to the bird on the left, and everything will be fine. And that's what it is. Every bird flies as close to the one on the left. It's just they bump into them. Ta-da! You could do it with a million of them if you want. So the single order generating rule for Scotland is, let's make Scotland the best place in the world to bring up kids. So everything we're trying to do then is about that. And it becomes far easier. Far easier. <laughs> Professionals will make it more technical and complicated than it needs to be, but it doesn't need to be like that. Frederick Douglass was born a slave. And that's just exactly the same thing. That notion about it's easy to do strong, strong children if they're broken. Mm -hmm. Always easy to do that. I always put this one up because I just love this guy. This is the human thing. Isn't it? He went to the shops and thought, so that. <laughs> I'm not having that. And he just stood in front of the tank. And, and, and there's another picture that I don't have with me, but the, the other picture that goes along with that is. Just in the background, about 500 yards for that, there's actually another two divisions of tanks. Like there's another 80 tanks there. So it's, he's not just taking on two, which end he could do. He's taking on a whole fleet of Chinese army. I, I've got visions of his wife sitting at home saying, give it out to the show. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, he's just decided I can do this. He need to say to him, here's the strategy, here's the plan, here's what, he just thought, that's not right. I'm going to do something about that. And that's, that's a key. And we need to recover some of the language that's out there. It's no professional language anymore. We need to speak about hope. Because <coughs> hope changes everything. Everything. And if we don't have hope, it's hopeless. And I'm emigrating. <laughs> it changes everything. Compassion changes everything. Redemption is how we can always do things. That's a measure of our compassion and our sociability, our humanity. That's a measure of ours, no anybody else. 
and the most important one of all. An infinitely large number of infinitesimally small actions. That's what history's made of. History's not made up of big plans. It's not made up of great big schemes. It's made up of individuals doing small things every day, doing the right thing. And that's how, and I always say this to the early years when I I don't have the science to tell you that what you've done and what you do has saved Joe Bloggs or Anne or Wally or I don't know that. But I'll tell you, I've been 39 years, I was 39 years a police officer, mostly working in work. I've been doing this stuff now for about 10 years, and I'm now at the University of St. Andrews. I'll tell you, I believe absolutely 100%. There are things happening in nurseries today that you're doing and you'll do tomorrow and you do every day that will stop someone getting into trouble, that will help them make a good decision about themselves, that will perhaps mean that there are people alive today that wouldn't otherwise have been alive, who are not alcoholics today who would otherwise have been alcoholics, who are in relationships today who wouldn't otherwise have been there because somebody at some point cared about and that's the human thing. And you do that every day. So see when you go home at night, take some pride in that. You really do need to take some pride in that because you're making a huge difference. Let's not concentrate on where it didn't work. And it, there will be kids. It will work. It will be really difficult. But there are more victories than defeats, I have to tell you. Absolutely more victories than defeats. Some of the young folk we've got in Scotland are absolutely outstanding and came from really difficult backgrounds. And see when you ask them, if you ask James, Docker who work for us. James will tell you the reason he's there is because people like you care about people like him. And it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. So it doesn't need to be perfect or curriculum for excellence or any of that stuff. It's just about doing the right thing. And you've maybe already changed the course. Harry Burns said that at his last talk at the, the learning one. You've maybe already done something for someone that's changed their life and you haven't even noticed it. And you won't notice it. It might be further down the line. And the good, the good news is, that's how easy it is to do. Because we conform to expectations. We'll make sure we give our kids the right expectations. The expectations to be as good as they can be, no matter what that is. We're not all going to be Harry Burns. We're not all going to be scientists. We're not going to be teachers. Be as good as you can be. It's first of all, be that. Be a good human being, first of all. That's the most important. Thanks very much.